When a hacker compromises a network or breaks into a computer, one of the first things they try and do is maintain access. They install these hooks and claws and implants and beacons, all things to maintain persistence. But there is a sort of balancing act with that because they want to remain stealthy. They want to fly under the radar. They don't want to be detected by the defenders or the blue team or the security practitioners and professionals trying to hunt down that adversary. So if a threat actor can use a very clever method for persistence, that's an attractive thing. And this one I thought was kind of neat. This was shared by Gregoras Torek on Twitter. Forgive me if I always get your name wrong, my friend, or Og tweet. And he says, hey, if you need an almost invisible post exploitation, persistent, fileless, LPE, or local privilege escalation backdoor? There are many. There are a whole lot of options, but this one looks really beautiful. Try this command from an elevated command prompt. sc.exe, sd set, sc manager, d colon parentheses, a semicolon, semicolon, k a semicolon, 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 wd parentheses. So I'll be the first to admit that looks like a really weird, crazy, random string of text. But it's not. There's actually a whole lot of meaning in there, and it's actually really cool and fascinating, but a little bit of a rabbit hole to dive into. There is a great write-up by another fella, 0xv1n, explaining how this works and how we might be able to use it. So let's take a look at the write-up, and let's see if we can make some sense of it and try it ourselves. This is abusing the service control manager for stealthy and persistent local privilege escalation. This is a living off the land technique because the tools that we're going to end up using, sc.exe, is already native and present and installed everywhere for Windows operating systems. Here's the gist. We need to already have some sort of access to be able to run this command and set up this backdoor. You do need a compromised privileged account so that we can go ahead and install this persistence mechanism or put this in place will abuse the service control manager to allow any arbitrary non-admin user to have full system permissions on a machine persistently by feeding it an overly permissive, basically anyone can do anything, access control list to the service control manager with SD set. So there is a whole lot of information on all this on the Microsoft documentation. You can track it down, I'll have the links in the description or anything that might be helpful here, but all in all, what we're gonna end up doing to create that long, seemingly random string is building a security descriptor. These security descriptors are built out of a security descriptor definition language, and that is the string format that could be used for some different functions or PowerShell commandlets or command prompt cmd.exe binaries that we could run. One thing to note here is that these SDDLs or security descriptor definition language strings are different than access control entries or ACEs. We'll chat about those in just a moment, but they are also very important. What you might have seen from the original tweet is that we'll be using the command scsd set, and that's using the sort of client to work with services, the service control client or sc.exe, and then a subcommand or parameter argument that we want to pass along to use sd set on a given server or serve is that we supply. We will, of course, need to supply the security descriptor all defined by the service descriptor definition language. Is this getting confusing yet? I know there are a whole lot of words, but we're gonna get into what all those letters meant just as well. So bear with me here. The security descriptor contains a couple different components. It could be making up the owner information or the primary group or DACL or SACL, if we wanna call them, and tokens for the access control entity. All we really need to fire the gun here is use that command that we saw in the tweet with this D colon A yada 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 daca wood i don't know if you want to say it like that but first let's dive into a little bit more of how this is all actually made up between the parentheses here, while we denote, oh, that D colon represents the discretionary access control, or a DACL. A DACL identifies users and groups who are allowed or denied access to some object. But in between those parentheses, you have all these different potential fields, like the ACE type. Remember, that's an access control entry in an access control list or setting here. The ACE flags, the rights, object GUID, inheritance, object, etc., etc. Now, all of these things are separated by a semicolon, as you saw in that syntax. They're all using a semicolon as a delimiter, and not all of these fields are filled in. We can see that ace flags was empty, object GUID is empty, and that's why we were seeing like, hey, a couple semicolons just kind of slapped together here in that syntax. So if you don't mind, let's kind of press the I believe button. We don't need to drill down and dig into each and every single potential option for every single one of those fields, whether it's ace flags or whatever. We kind of just kind of want to speed run into, okay, what's the detonator for this? This example. We know that we're going to be supplying access allowed. We know that we're going to be giving all access to just about everyone or everything, and actually even giving the security principle of literally everyone, we could go ahead and choose. Given a specific ACE security principle, or again, that access control entry, we could use WD for everyone. 
That means that we're giving every single user, all of them, permissions on the service control manager. So Joe Schmo, so low privilege account Danny, whatever, could go ahead and create their own services or binaries and executables that could run with the Supreme system, NT authority system and admin access. So now enough talk, let's go ahead and play with this thing. I am running inside of a Windows 11 virtual machine. I'm logged in as a user that has admin access. And for the moment, we're just gonna set stuff up. I do, of course, have a low privilege account ready for me to use, but for now, hey, let's kind of get a lay of the land. We know that we need an admin level prompt. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up the Windows terminal. I'll right click it and say, let's run as administrator. I will be prompted with UAC, user account control to say, yes, I totally wanna run this as admin, but that is just, local admin. I kind of want to go one step further. I want to be able to run this as system. So what I'm going to end up doing is actually moving into a folder where I have the sysinternal suite already prepared and ready for me. There we go. So inside of the sysinternal suite utilities, you do have psexec. Those commands and those tools that will allow you to actually oftentimes remotely execute code or run other processes on another machine, but we can just as easily use it on our own local machine to become NT authority system. The way that we do that is we pass in tac s to note this current session, I think maybe, tac i for interactive, and then cmd.exe to open a command prompt as NT authority system. If you don't believe me, once this thing fires up, we can go ahead and run who am I? And I am in fact NT authority system. Now remember, we wanna go ahead and use our sc.exe. In the command prompt itself, we don't exactly need to use that .exe. In PowerShell, we probably want to because we're denoting, hey, I wanna run that literal binary in C Windows System 32. And before we go making changes, we can actually go ahead and see what we have set for our security descriptor on the SC manager service. So I'm gonna use SD show rather than SD set for this first command. Once I hit enter here, you get this giant big long blob of whatever. That is the security descriptor that is currently set. I'm gonna go ahead and put this in notepad just so I can save it sort of off to the side so I can easily revert back to this thing, you know, just for the sake of experimentation and playing around. Let's take note of this super quick. One thing to note here is that you can actually pass another command or argument to this and actually say show rights. And that is something that will end up telling you what are all of these things actually representing that they're allowed to be able to do within the security descriptor, within that security descriptor description language, whatever that SSDDL thing was. But now, just so you uh, are following along here, I am gonna check the users on this machine. I have my account, John H, and then a low privilege user. If I could actually go ahead and check out that low priv user, we do not have access in the local administrators group because this is not an admin account. It's a low privilege user. Of course, taking a look at that with my own account, John H, you'll see that I am in local admin. But now that that has been level set, we can actually go ahead and fire the gun here. We know we wanna use SC and then SD set to set the security descriptor for our SC manager or our service control manager service. And we need to go grab whatever that unique, special, crazy, actual service descriptor was. That big, long DACA, WACA, whatever. Here it is. Copy and paste this, setting that discretionary access control. Let me go ahead and slap that in. I'll hit enter and it says, hey, security set service object security success. Lots of S's, alliteration. And now if we wanted to verify that, we could actually go ahead and use SD show once more to see that we have in fact made that change. There it is with a couple of other ones. Hey, I'm cool with it. Maybe those are again, just the other permissions that could be set. You remember that is a, another actual component here of the security descriptor, the SACL. Now, one thing that 0xv1n goes ahead and actually makes a good point of, look, this is where you as the defenders, you security practitioners and professionals should flag this. Like, hey, this should be shouting and screaming alarm bells and have all the whistles be blowing because this is a detection opportunity. Any modifications to the access control list for the service control manager should probably, you know, start to sound the alarm. Below is a sample sigma rule to go ahead and detect this behavior if you were to go ahead and use this. Uh, and again, this is the syntax for that sigma uh, modification tracking change. And they do reference the original tweet from Gregores or Og tweet on Twitter. Here is the syntax that obviously we just saw, sc.exe, and then the portions of the command that are present on the command line. Okay, let me switch gears here. Remember, I was the local admin. Now I wanna switch to my low privilege account. So I'm gonna be switching user context to no longer local admin, but my low priv. Okay, logged in there. Hang on, before we go any further, let me get a quick word from today's sponsor. When you're performing a penetration test, you're in the zone. 
You're hacking away, and you're having fun, gathering findings, beating up vulnerabilities, and earning domain admin. But you might be dreading the work that comes after. You have to write a report. But writing a pen test report doesn't have to be dull and boring and long and tedious. In fact, it can be a breeze. You don't even have to worry about your report because PlexTrack can handle it for you. If you aren't familiar, PlexTrack is the premier cybersecurity reporting and collaboration platform that makes penetration testers, red teamers, and cybersecurity teams more efficient, effective, and proactive. PlexTrack removes the pain of reporting and lets you collaborate between both red and blue teams for effective purple teaming and faster remediation. The PlexTrack platform lets you easily aggregate findings, pull in reusable content from write-up databases and content libraries, and track and measure engagement progress in real time. Import assets from CSV files or Nmap or Nessus and so many others of your favorite tools. With over 25 integrations, you can streamline your reporting and collaboration process right into your existing workflow. You can do even faster testing with PlexTrack's runbooks and show the impact to managers and leadership with PlexTrack's analytics and visualizations. Within minutes, you can have your pen test report done and dusted, all with your team's logo and details and then sent off to the client. Spend more time hacking and less time reporting. Learn how you can boost your team's efficiency by 30% and cut reporting time by up to 65% with PlexTrack. Seriously, check out PlexTrack. I have great colleagues and peers that use PlexTrack every day for reporting. Get started with my link below in the video description and let you and your team get back to hacking. Huge thanks to PlexTrack for sponsoring this video. Now again, if I try to open up a Windows terminal, and if I were to try and right click to run as admin, here we go, run as administrator, UAC or the user account control will pop up and say, look, you don't have access to this. You aren't allowed to do this unless you know your admin password, in which case you probably wouldn't because you're just Joe Schmo, low privilege access. So we would not be able to do this normally. However, because of our back door that we just created, I can go ahead and open just a regular context, regular privileges, Windows terminal, open up the command prompt, and I could go ahead and now set a service. One thing to note here is that when I open up the Windows terminal, at least for me, the way that I have this, the default configuration of Windows terminal, it is going to throw me into PowerShell by default. So because I'm going to be working with that old school cmd.exe binary for sc.exe, the sc command within PowerShell PowerShell is an alias. It's like an actual commandlet for set content. Rather than dealing with the osc.exe and like whatever, however PowerShell is going to like process those quotes, uh, I am just going to momentarily drop into cmd.exe. So now let's use sc to go ahead and create our own service. Uh, we'll use that to actually add our low privilege user into the admin group so that it can perform its own privilege escalation, right? I'm going to go ahead and create a service and I'll call mine like Google Up update or whatever, I don't know, something to, to masquerade and blend in with the environment. And we will need to supply the display name. You can set display name equals, and then I'll supply within quotes, just Google updater one more time. One thing to note here is that you do have to include the space right in between your equal sign and the value you actually want to put present here. Uh, between the way that old school sc.exe actually parses or tokenizes whatever arguments or parameters, you just have to include that space, so be cognizant of that. Uh, including, we'll go ahead and supply the bin path, or the binary path that we want to end up going ahead and executing. So I will go ahead and say, let's use the absolute path to our system32 net.exe. The very, very same net user command that you saw us run just a moment ago, we're going to be using that net.exe binary, but rather than interrogating the users, I want to get into the local groups, and that is singular, uh, and then we'll supply actually the admin administrators group, and say, Cool, okay, inside of the administrator's group, I actually wanna go ahead and put my low privilege user, the username for the account we wanna add into the admin group. And we'll go ahead and add it with forward slash add. Now, finally, you will need to go ahead and supply the start mechanism or the startup process and style for this service. I'll go ahead and specify that as auto for automatic, and then fingers crossed, if I enter here, Looks like it works. Create service is success. And I could go ahead and actually SC query our Google updater 
service that we've just created. We can see it does exist, it is currently stopped, but because of the automatic startup, now the next time this computer reboots, it'll actually kick off and run and will be added into the admin group. Remember, we're not in there right now. If I actually take a look at my low privilege user, still just a poor regular lame-o user. But let me go ahead and reboot and let's see if this thing works. I'll go ahead and click restart. Okay, now I will need to ask from you a little bit of suspended disbelief. Cause say we're gonna be the threat actor or the hacker and the adversary and we'll log back in or we'll remain our access with our low privilege user. We had that some time ago, right? Because hey, we compromised the machine to begin with. But if we were to lose that access as the admin, now we have this back door or this persistence mechanism where, hey, even my low privilege user would be able to fire up the command prompt or do anything now as an administrator because they're in the local admin group. And hey, user account control or UAC is gonna be a little bit annoying here, but say again, suspended disbelief, you did know that low privilege user account password. Again, say you're the adversary, you were able to scrape those creds from memory one way or the other here. Ultimately, we've got our admin shell, and let me just pop back into CMD real quick, because if I take a look at the net user accounts, here's our low privilege Joe Schmo, but if I actually were to zoom in on him, he is a member of the local admins group. He is a local admin. Now we can run that that same PS exec and hey, become NT authority system yet again, there is our back door, there is our persistence mechanism and potentially sometimes privilege escalation. Because here's the thing about this technique, right? Say the admin, the actual genuine sysadmin or whatever blue team security practitioners and defenders were to catch on that this user is now suddenly a member of the local admin group. If they remove him, you still have that owner access and everyone is granted permission to the SC manager or the the service control manager. So you can just slap that baby right back in. You can create another service, you can create whatever service, and you can be really as stealthy as you want. And I mean to say that in that, look, you could obfuscate this. Whatever batch tricks with variables you wanna do for those commands, or even hook this thing up within PowerShell. I don't know, do some IEX download string, grab it from an external resource, and it's mangled and weird. That has a little bit of runway here. And I think even the small, simple command, SC, SD set, whatever weird SDDL security descriptor we did, that opened the door to remain open for however long time. With all that said, hey, hats off and kudos and credit. Credit where credit is due to Gregoras Torek and AugTweet on Twitter as his handle there and 0xv1n for his article blog post that explained this a little bit further and how we could actually do it, how we could play with it, what you might be able to use to create a service and get that back door in there so any user could just plop right in to the admin local group. Hey, hats off to them. Again, we're standing on the shoulders of giants here. This is their work, and I just want to help celebrate that one of the ways that I could. Thank you so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care.